нас сегодня большая честь при... заслушать Сорна Ларсона, всего лекции ветровая энергетика. Но Сорн э, у нас ведущий э, эксперт в Европе по проблемам ветровой энергетики. У него очень большой опыт исследования, использования и значит, ни один из европейских проектов, посвященных этой проблеме, не обходится без участия Ларсона. То есть я вот в этом смысле подчеркиваю, нам очень крупно повезло, что мы можем из первых уст заслушать доклад, посвященный этой тематике. Вот. Ну, собственно, ветровая энергетика, ну, всем понятно, что это быстро развивающаяся область во всем мире. Но, как обычно, в некоторых передовых областях Россия здесь сильно отстает. У нас ветровая энергетика не развивается, ресурсы о, или доступная энергия, которая реально используется в ветре, это ничтожно мало по сравнению с тем, что происходит во всем мире, ну опять же в Европе. Вот. Для того, чтобы как-то стимулировать это направление, ну, вот в том мегаграде, в рамках которого проводится эта лекция, у нас есть специальная такая задача, и вот Сорен у нас приглашен работать в рамках мегагранта, ну и вот передавать свой опыт, учить, обучать и так далее, то есть чтобы мы максимально много смогли получить вот от его уникального опыта. То есть это быстро развивающаяся область науки. К сожалению, не так много, как хотелось бы, может быть, видеть здесь молодых специалистов, но тем не менее лекция записана, она всегда доступна на сайте лаборатории, ее визуальное сопровождение и слайды, так что я думаю, это можно будет потом и другим, не торопясь, посмотреть и послушать. Вот. Ну, как вы знаете, лекция будет на английском языке, но я так полагаю, что для присутствующих это не будет большой проблемой, по крайней мере, основной смысл будет понятен. Вот. Ну, тогда я даю слово Сорону, пожалуйста. Uh, yeah, please ask questions. Thank you for the nice words, which I didn't understand, of course, but uh, um, I presume they were nice. And now I know that many of you do not have English as a first language, uh, and uh, therefore If there's something you don't understand, and also if there's something else you want to ask, just fire along while I'm speaking, because then it's the best way to get things resolved. I will talk about wind resource estimation, and uh, with resource, wind resource, we simply mean how much wind energy is available at a certain spot to estimate that. And to a very large extent, this is a meteorological discipline. So we apply here meteorology for this technical discipline, which is to build wind turbines and use the energy. Let's see. Uh -huh. uh, it's sort of loosely broken down in three parts. The first part is, what is the, the wind turbine? people want to know from the meteorologist. And uh, then how do we answer them? And the second part is how do we tell them what they want to know using data from different climate stations that has been in operation for a long time. And the third part is How do we do when we have to use numerical weather modeling? Uh, because there is no data, good data enough in the neighborhood, or because we cannot model the terrain the simple way we do it the first message. So that's the three parts. Now, the first is, what are the questions to meteorology? And the question is, What annual power production can be expected in a given geographical location with a given wind turbine? And you can see the underlying question is, does it pay? Do I earn enough money to pay all my expenses? 
To answer that, we have to see at the definitions. How much annual wind power is available if you have an area and the wind is coming like that? How much wind power do you get per square meter per second there? And what you do is that it's a kinetic energy that is flowing by in your system with a wind speed. So therefore, it's the wind speed cubed. And then you have to multiply by the density and one half. And then that's the average annual wind power available per square meter in the air. You can also write it another way. And that's uh, the second thing. You can say that, OK, if you have the distribution of wind, the probability distribution of the wind, we can just integrate it together with the wind power available on the square meter, and then we get the average uh, wind power on the square meter again. So it means that the best answer we can give from the beginning is that we should be able to tell what is the distribution of wind speed at any given spot in the atmosphere at any given height where people can be interested. Now, if it is, uh, if you now put a wind turbine there, that's a lower equation, then you have to multiply. So what the wind turbine, if I can find a stick, Wind speeds, then he can also shift the power curve. And it's reverse, 
we have two hydrogen species and also see the power curve. So we can always optimize how much wind energy you take out of a given system <coughs> within limits. But that's why we have to tell more than, than just the mean speed and a few classes. We have to tell as much of the wind distribution so that the, wind, uh, the power the producer of the wind turbines can adapt his, his power curves to the situation. So these are the two questions. So we need very good quality data because we need to, this is, there's no way we can make anything better than, take, than the data. If the data have some errors in them and we don't correct them, then all these errors will sort of progress through all our computations. So we need good data. Um, enough good data to determine an annual mean distribution, like the one Dominic looked before. And uh, long enough so that we get a good annual climate description. And uh, this guy there is a sort of climatic hero who has been doing measurements there for 10 years and uh, service the station with sure everything was there. So that's one of the ways to get good data. When we have good data from a climate station, the next problem is that the wind climate measured at one location, you can see to the right over there, is not the same location where the older one two places wind turbine. Therefore, we have to find a method to interpolate, extrapolate the data we have from the station down to the right up to where the wind turbine owner want to put his wind turbine. So that's the first method. So how do we do that? Now I'll show you how we don't do it. We don't just draw a linear uh, curve between two points and say this is the interpolation between if you have wind measurements at the coast there, there's a small measuring station, and inland, and in between we have a, a straight line because the wind will always be strongly dependent on the very local nature. It can be behind a hill, in front of a hill, on the top of a hill, just behind a forest. It can be very many places that really strongly influence the wind. So we have to know more about uh, the variation in between. How do we do that? We ask the boundary layer meteorologists, and they say the world has two atmospheric layers, the free atmosphere, which is about a kilometer and up, where the influence of the underlying surface is weak and not direct. And then we have the atmospheric boundary layer, where the coupling between the surface and the atmosphere is direct and uh, where all takes place. At the top, we have an undisturbed geostrophic wind which is a wind that, that's just controlled by the pressure gradient. And then down at the bottom, we have various kinds of topography. Uh, you can see at the left, we have a measuring station, and out at the right, we have a wind turbine. And the topography in between, it has different hills, and it has different uh, vegetation and, and land use. And it's just in front of the wind turbine, that is what we call an obstacle, something that protrudes into the wind and will break it and, and disturb it. Uh, now, modern wise, this the wind energy, we always use, well, not always, but in the beginning we used what we call neutral uh, stability flow, and that is the circular properties of the air is unimportant. And this is, you could say it's justified by two things. The principal thing is that it's, uh, wind energy is about fairly strong wind. And with a fairly strong wind, then the mechanical properties of, of, of the fluid dominates the certain properties. And it also, it's so over land, but not to the same extent so over the water. And then the other reason to do it is 
that we have difficulties to doing anything with that. I mean, the formulations, the data, and everything is not so well established when we come to the survey of the, of the uh, stations. So we only use neutral flow, and that means that the surface will be characterized by a roughness, which is simply a measure of the friction between the air and the surface. This is normally called C0, C0, and the first of these many sets of that. Uh, then we have also, just after the measure, there's a small hill, and just in front of the ring turbine, there's a, a, an escarpment. Now, these new changes of the surface give rise to what we call internal boundary layer. It's all something that functions within the boundary layer, but whenever a new feature in the surface shows up, somehow it communicates to the wind that, hey, the surface is changing. And there are two types of uh, boundary. If the roughness is changing, then it's a diffusive process. The knowledge that it's a new roughness under me, it diffuses slowly upwards. And that's all that occurs that bend, because it, the further downstream you come from the new surface, the further up it goes. So it bends slowly there, and the migration of the information about the new roughnesses comes further and further up. Then over the hill, and over the just uh, wind turbines, there is a bobbing indicated. The internal boundary layer there is pressure induced, because the slows flow have to go over something, and that's the pressure that ensures that. And you can see it goes both upstream and downstream as opposed to the diffusive uh, migration of the information, which only goes upwards. But uh, these two features, three features, we have to handle. We have to handle the variation of the terrain, how does that influence the flow, and we have to Now, since we have to handle all these features, we cannot just do with the wind speed distribution. We also have to describe the direction, because the wind direction determines all these terrain features which the wind passes when it comes from one station to another. So, if the wind direction changes, it's new features, and, and, and therefore we have to know also the wind direction. So, this is these two distributions there are the essential thing we need to know from a mission station. And then we have to be able to describe the terrain around it. We now have the wind distribution, both with the direction and, and the strengths. The first thing we see is obstacles. If you come from a station, what do we see around? There shouldn't be any, but there will all be a house and edges have grown up. And you have to be able to see what's the influence of those things. And fortunately, that's a discipline that has been worked on a lot in the wind tunnels. Because people have started to help us the distortion of the flow behind a, let's say, a house roof. And it's parameterized and described. We also have other obstacles. This is hedges, living fences. Uh, they're different from buildings in the sense that the wind also goes through them. But that's also quite described. So how do we sort of handle this? We have to go out and see where they are. We, uh, we have to have the knowledge about where are these things. When we have them, you can see the power. Figure there, you can see there's a measuring point there for the end of the edge. Edge there. And there are a few hedges and there are some buildings and then you have to put them in a place so you can sum and add the different uh, uh, flow distortions that the each will, 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 uh, will cause on the measuring point depending on the wind direction. And this is put in, into a little model below and they are all fixed. So this was afterwards. Now we can do that. Then we, I talked about roughness, different surface characteristics, 
And as I said, overall, it's a measure of how much friction there is between the air and the surface when the air moves over it. It's important because now this is, I think, the only meteorological formation formulas I introduced. The other one is called the logarithmic profile. It's a wind speed and structure of height. It's also a coefficient for common constant. Uh, and then it has uh, a friction velocity for the moon and the star. And then it's a logarithm, logarithm to set divided by this roughness and sigma. So this is a logarithmic profile. And that is a very standard thing. Then we have the geostrophic rack or capture G is a geostrophic ring. So that's a ring way over the boundary layer. And it says that this is also related to, you can say, the star and the roughness of the surface. So now, if you have a geostrophic ring and you have a roughness, then you can also compute the, the wind profile with the other formula. You can compute the wind profile in the nose under the lead of something like that. Namely, as a logarithm of, because for the geostrophic relation, and if you said not, then uh, you find your star, and then you find your and said not, then you can plot the, uh, the logarithm. But I should say the small f is a uh, Coyote's force. Coyote's pattern. Now, this is the formula set. This does show that this roughness is important for the wind speed to experience down in the boundary. And when you have a layer, that's where we live. And that's where the wind turbine stands in the right wings back there. Now, 50 meter is all too low today, where well, it's typically 100 to 200 meter. Uh, we have here to but the principle is the same. Now, we took a geostrophic wind about everything near 9 meter per second. And then the red curve is roughness, but for a medium sized town, it's hard to move. Then you go to a sort of standard field, plot on, it's five centimeter. And then all the way down to water, which is something of the smoothest we can make here on Earth. It's about a tenth of a millimeter. And you can see the wind increase. So it's important for where you put up the wind turbine and uh, what kind of roughnesses you have around. And it's important in your estimation of how much wind you have anywhere, but what you associate the roughness on the ground. Now, you cannot see so much of that, but this is one of the way. Roughness is a kind of uncertain parameter. You can either be very physical, a formula of, or you can use experience. This is one of these tables that exist. It has a roughness in meter up to the left, and then in the middle is a terrain characteristic. As we say, you start with sea and forest up to a meter, and then you have a water area of lake to us and open sea, with a tenth of a meter. And then in between you have all kinds of uh, different landscapes and, and uh, land utilization. And that's important as we shall see because we cannot see the roughness, but we can see the land uh, utilization from space, for example, where we can also see it just walk out and move. Then one of the things that happens, uh, as I showed you, was <coughs> we do not have one roughness, so we have several roughnesses. We walk from land land to sea and from field to forest to cities and all areas have a certain roughness. We know how to handle roughness change with this uh, an internal boundary layer. It grows slowly from the, you can see the left side is the upstream condition and the right hand side is a turf with a new roughness coming up. There are it starts and you can see the slow growth of what we call the internal boundary layer. So that's a high to reach the atmosphere is perturbed by the new surface. The wind above that height doesn't know that it's 
Commonwealth well Web Services it still has the offspring uh, wind conditions. And so, of course, you can match the profiles there and find the wind down. So, so this is well established combinations. So now, I think we have more. Then comes orography that the wind goes over hills and seeps down into valleys. And <coughs> we have to know more than, than it does that. We also have to know what it means for the wind speed and things like that. And there are formulations, and you can see the friction rock to the right. On the top of the hill, the wind will always increase lower to the hill. And close behind and in front, the wind will be, will, uh, be reduced because there's been pressure. But of course, uh, some years ago, we had a huge experiment with the new heaviness, simply because the numerics of our heavy was not good enough. And people traveled all over the world to find an idea here. And, and this was here uh, on one of the islands west of Scotland. And you see this wall ring to, uh, mast, the Tulatica mast, placed across the hill. And that uh, gave rise to these formulations that are used in, in this uh, here. No, I, again, I think I'm going to because it's not very clear. But the, the left hand side is the wind profile. The straight line is the upstream. It's an operating profile in the rock plot, so it's a dinner. And then the, the triangle is the perturbed wave. And the, the right hand is the perturbation along a line, along the mass line. And you see, uh, you can, for a wind turbine owner, you have to go on the top of the hill because you can earn 50 to 100 percent of the wind by going uh, up on even amounts. So, and that was what came out of this experiment. So now we have all the bottle components, and I will not go into the bottle uh, construction and how it's all done. But we have, that's all these components go in. So you have to imagine I'm sitting here, I have data there, and put the wind turbine there. And then when the wind is coming from here, this mass, the data, we experience all these terrain features. And the wind turbine, on the other hand, experience a number of other terrain features. So how do I connect these two? And of course, I have to have the measure, real measures of how does the surface look. It's not enough to say we can do this in that way. We have to know how it looks in some country somewhere. So what do we have then of data? We have meteorology stations, of course. Then we have a lot of maps showing orography and land use. Land use is important because that also gives you the roughness. Then there's zillions of international and national organizations that publish data about their corner of the world or the whole world about all kinds of aspects. So you have to go in and look there for the information. And, and today, now, now I say today, Google is important, of course, extremely important because a lot of this information is, uh, is collected and easily overlooked in Google Earth. Uh, so so uh, in the older days, we said site inspections are extremely important because you cannot, you see different things if you're staying on a site.